In this video, we'll look at the Heathkit GRS 65A 2 watt transceiver walkie talkie. I'll cover the history of the radio, its features and key design aspects, and go over the controls and connectors. We'll also take a look inside. I'll talk about the restoration of these two units and then give a demonstration of the radios in use. Heathkit was a company that sold electronic devices in kit form from the late 1940s through the early 1990s. Their product line included radio, test equipment, and various consumer products. By building a piece of electronics, you could save money and gain the satisfaction of having assembled it yourself. Though better known for their amateur radio equipment, Heathkit sold a number of citizens band radios ranging from low-end walkie-talkies to base and mobile units. There was a huge surge in popularity in CB radio in the early 1970s, but the band was originally created in the U.S. in 1958, and Heathkit offered equipment starting with the CB1 in 1959. Over the years, they offered five different models of walkie-talkies in nine base stations or mobile units, up to about 1970, at which time there was likely too much competition from other, mostly offshore, manufacturers to be price competitive. FCC regulations in the U.S. and Canada did not allow CB radios to be built from kits, so these units were all commercially assembled, other than one exception that I'm aware of. The GW21 model of walkie-talkie was offered as a kit that the user assembled, but had a few essential components missing needed to operate it. After assembly, the user shipped the unit back to Heathkit, where they installed the remaining components and aligned and tested it. It was then returned to the owner with the required DOT approval number. This scheme allowed Heathkit to get around the regulations on kit-built radios. As far as I can determine, this was only offered for the Canadian model, and I've only seen it in one 1964 catalog, so it may have proved not to be cost-effective and discontinued. The GRS-65A was a single-channel, citizens band walkie-talkie offered from 1966 to 1968. It was sold factory-assembled. Note the labeling says Heath-built rather than Heathkit. I believe this model was only sold in Canada. It does not show up in my U.S. catalogs of the era, only Canadian ones, and the advertising says that it was designed and built in Canada. It was also said to be tested to work down to minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit for the Canadian climate. The range was said to be up to 6 miles, less indoors, and greater if used from a plane. This ad also had the admonition not permitted for children, although I'm not aware of there ever being a legal age requirement for CB radio in Canada. The model number seems to be a reference to GRS for General Radio Service, the official name for the equivalent of CB radio in Canada. This was the only product in the GRS series, and it's unclear why the model was GRS 65A, as there was no GRS 65. It's similar to the Heathkit GW21 and GW52 models of walkie-talkies. In fact, the GW21 used the same size case and had similar controls, but was a much lower-powered 100 milliwatt unit. The GRS65A sold for a price of $99.95 Canadian each, later reduced to $79.95. It required a pair of crystals for the desired channel, which were $5.95 per pair. Included was a rechargeable NICAD battery, which advertisements called a $30 value, but the battery charger was $9.95 and a car adapter was available for $2.95. It came with a metal telescoping antenna. An optional 12-inch fiberglass whip antenna was offered for $4.95. It originally came with a leather shoulder strap and elastic hand strap. CB radios of this vintage, mid-1960s, were pretty standard designs. Most were solid state, although some still used tubes in the transmitter section. All were crystal controlled, and most were superhet designs, although the low-end walkie-talkies used a super-regenerative design, which was distinguished by the hissing sound they made. Typically, they used discrete transistors until integrated circuits were introduced in the 1970s. Later units moved to using synthesizers to avoid the need for crystals, and the original 23 CB channels were expanded to 40 in 1977. Modulation was AM with later designs supporting single sideband as well. The GRS65A is a single channel superhead design rated at 2 watts DC input power. 
Receiver sensitivity was rated at 1 microvolt and cell activity 8 kilohertz. It used a 12 and a half volt 500 milliamp hour rechargeable NICAD battery pack rated at about 8 hours of use per charge. The catalog descriptions claim it had an automatic noise limiter, but I don't see any evidence of circuitry specifically for this. Let's take a look at the controls and connectors. It features a metal telescoping antenna 38 inches or about 1 meter in length. There's a warning sticker that the antenna should be fully extended, although a catalog description mentions using it indoors over short distances with the antenna collapsed. The two controls on top are for power and volume and for squelch. There's an RCA jack for an external antenna which could be used with a mobile, i.e. car antenna for example. The internal antenna does not get disconnected when an external antenna is used. There's a press to talk button on the side. Behind the grill is the speaker which is also the microphone during transmit. On the bottom is the connection for the battery charger or car adapter. The sticker on the bottom says made in Canada. On the back is the required sticker which lists the Canadian Department of Transport approval number and the maker as Daystrom Limited, Cooksville, Ontario. Daystrom was the parent company of Heathkit at the time and Cooksville, now the city of Mississauga, was the location of Heathkit's Canadian head office. This unit had a serial number of 1367. On my other unit the sticker is partially missing and the serial number is absent. The original leather shoulder strap and elastic hand strap are missing on these units, but you can see the snap connectors on the sides and brackets on the back where these would have attached. Let's take a look at the inside circuitry starting with the charger. This was model GRA652, was an optional accessory and was unique to being used with these walkie-talkies. Inside it's very simple with only a step down transformer, fuse, and number 47 current limiting lamp that also indicates when the battery is charging. It actually puts out AC which is rectified by a diode inside the walkie talkie. The nominal voltage is 14 volts but the no load voltage is about 34 volts AC. It's rated at 0.24 amps. There are two plugs to allow charging up to two units at one time. And the connectors are like those for AC interlock cheater cords, except that they're polarized. The case is heavy plastic. I believe it's Bakelite. This simple charger was adequate for NICAD batteries, but not for more modern batteries like lithium ion or nickel metal hydride, which need a smart charger to avoid damage. Now let's look inside the radio. All circuitry is on one single-sided printed circuit board. The board's made from phenolic material and has some silk screening. Attached by screws to the PCB is the top panel which holds the antenna and controls. I'll point out a few of the notable components. Volume and squelch controls, audio transformer, 100 ohm loudspeaker which was also used as a microphone, a pretty standard trick for walkie talkies, press to talk switch, transmit and receive crystals, tuning inductors for the RF front end, and the IF transformers. The circuit uses nine silicon transistors for the following functions. RF amplifier, receive converter, first IF amplifier, second IF amplifier, audio driver, audio output, audio modulator, two transistors, transmitter oscillator, and RF final amplifier, which has a heat sink. It also uses six diodes. The radio supports one CB channel set by the two socketed crystals. The reason for two crystals per channel is that the transmit crystal runs at the transmit frequency, but the receive crystal is for the converter, which is offset by the IF frequency of 455 kilohertz. A 455 kHz IF was pretty standard for CB equipment as it allowed using low cost and widely available AM radio parts. The crystals in this unit are for CB channel 16, and are marked CH16T and CH16R and used frequencies of 27.155 MHz, this is CB channel 16, and 27.610 MHz, channel 16 plus the 455 kHz IF frequency. Power from the charger came in from the bottom and was rectified to DC by this diode. 
The original battery was a 12.5 volt, 500 milliamp hour NICAD, but as I'll explain later, it's been replaced by a newer battery. I bought this pair of radios with the charger in December 2015 from a local seller on Kijiji at low cost. The seller knew nothing about them and said they came in a box of junk and did not know if they're working. They seem to be in pretty good cosmetic condition. When initially tested, both produced some hiss from the speaker when the charger was connected. One unit seemed to be able to store some charge in the battery and the other would not draw enough current from the charger to light the lamp. They came with no documentation. Because they were not sold as kits, they would not have had the usual comprehensive Heathkit assembly manual. There must have been an operation manual of some kind, but I've been unable to find anything on the internet. I did find a poor copy of the schematic on the internet. Further research indicated that the service information was published in Sam's PhotoFact CB radio series, volume 14 from June 1967. I looked at various suppliers to get a copy of this, and the lowest cost option was actually to buy an original copy from the Schematic Man, which was cheaper than buying the downloadable version for just this one radio from Sam's official website. I gave the units a good cleaning. The value of all resistors were checked, and while most had drifted high, they were all within acceptable values. The ESR of the electrolytic caps was measured, and many of them were high, so I replaced all of them, a total of seven per radio. The controls were cleaned with contact cleaner. After recapping, the audio output was much louder and the radios were able to pick up a signal from a generator and to output an RF signal. After receiving the service manual, I reviewed the alignment procedure. It's quite simple, it involves first peaking the three IF transformers with a 455 kHz signal applied with a signal generator, then peaking RF coils A4 and A5 with a signal on the crystal receive frequency. I needed to remove some wax from the IF transformers using a heat gun before I could adjust them. I also found that alignment needed to be done while the PCB was mounted in the metal case as it affects the tuning of the RF coils. There are no adjustments to the transmitter circuit, so while it's technically not legal for unlicensed technicians to make changes to CB transmitters, it's okay to align this radio because it's only the receiver that's adjusted. After alignment, the radio seemed to be working fine. After restoration and alignment of one radio, I moved on to the other unit. I measured the RF output with an oscilloscope and a 50 ohm dummy load connected to the external antenna jack. With a power input of 12.5 volts DC, I measured an RF output of about 600 milliwatts. While the unit's rated at 2 watts, this is DC input power, and the actual RF output is expected to be quite a bit less. The original NICAD batteries were in bad shape unable to hold a charge and with lots of leaking of chemicals inside. I ordered two low-cost lithium-ion battery packs on eBay for just over ten dollars each including chargers. I picked units that would fit in the existing battery compartment. They're meant for closed-circuit TV cameras and available from several Chinese sellers on eBay. They're rated at 1800 milliamp hours which is almost four times the capacity of the original 500 milliamp hour NICAD batteries in about half the volume. I installed them using double sided tape and soldering the appropriate connector to the power wires. You need to open the case to charge them. I may in future wire up the original charger connector to avoid this. As explained earlier these batteries require a smart charger and can't use the original radio's charger. The unit is simple to operate. You simply turn it on and adjust the volume to a comfortable level. A certain amount of background noise is normal, but it's much quieter than the Super Regen units, which produced a constant hissing sound. You typically adjust the squelch control so that it just goes quiet with no signal. To transmit, you press the push to talk button on the side and speak into the speaker. The antenna should normally be fully extended when transmitting. This signal is being received from the other unit in another room of the house. The range outdoors was claimed to be about six miles and battery life eight hours with intermittent transmitting. The catalog suggested applications such as hunting or fishing lodges in summer and winter resorts.
I've joked with my wife that we could use these radios to communicate when we were at the shopping mall. The heavy metal units with an almost four foot long antenna look ridiculous compared to a modern smartphone. To be honest, I'm a licensed amateur radio operator and it somewhat pains me to use a CB radio, although when I was young I had several sets of walkie-talkies that I enjoyed playing with. I even have this set of more modern 49 megahertz FM Radio Shack walkie-talkies that I picked up at a thrift shop a few years ago. My five-year-old grandson received a pair of low-end walkie-talkies this past Christmas and I noted that they're the old super regenerative type that were an old design even when I was his age. The GRS65A was Heathkit's top-of-the-line walkie-talkie with more power and range than any other models they offered. The GRS65A is also rather unique in that it is one of the few Canadian-designed Heathkits. That makes these radios quite rare, although they do appear on eBay from time to time. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please check out my other videos on vintage radio and test equipment.